On the judgment day, entering into the courtroom, what is the judge going to say? Could this be my doom? The accuser says, I win. Look at all their sin, but with arms out open wide, Jesus calls you to his side and says, Redeemed, redeemed, your sins are washed away. been so good oh praise God it's touched my heart tear in my eye man Amen. just thank the Lord for that testimony brother it's glad to have the, the bass baritone whatever section back in the house amen and uh, I'm glad you're you're, uh, you're here and your son's here too just uh, he's doing doing a little better still trying to fight off that look cough but man what a blessing and uh, you guys are gonna be singing are you singing next week anywhere are you singing tonight you yeah, singing tonight yeah praise the Lord over at Maranatha and um, you just stay busy and if, if you uh, sung like that, you stay busy too, I'm sure. But uh, praise the Lord. And it comes from the heart. Uh, these are these are their songs that they write. Amen. And so I'm just so thankful for their music ministry. It's been a blessing. It is my privilege to honor one of my closest friends, preacher friends uh, that I have. And I'll tell you what, my friend, Pastor Perry, Manly Perry, he pastors in San Antonio, Texas. And it took, it, you guys drove up, right? And it was, how long, 20-some hours, right? 22 hours to come and be with us and I want to thank him for coming but he is a preacher of the word he loves souls and he's going to he's going to open up the word this morning I hope that I hope you'll just listen and open up your heart and don't quench the spirit this morning and I believe the Lord will speak to your heart he's been praying about what to preach and I, it's just my privilege and honor to invite my pastor friend Pastor Manly Perry to come and preach for us this time love you brother thank you come and preach Amen. Turn to Acts chapter 11, if you would, please. Acts chapter 11. 
And I just want to say what a blessing it is to be back with you, what a blessing it is to have been invited back to preach your anniversary uh, service. I don't know, I guess I've been here about five years or so, five yes, or six sir. years I've been preaching your Amen. anniversary service, and such an honor. And uh, what a blessing it is to have dedicated men from our church willing to take vacation time to come up here for souls and, Amen. and help set the tent up. The Brown family's a dear have friends of ours and, and we sure do uh, love them and appreciate them uh, what a blessing they are amen amen you know right now in my truck my cd player you'll find leonard skinner i mean uh <laughs> you'll, you'll find uh, the, the, the brown family amen you'll find the brown family amen. and i sure do love them and appreciate them boy i tell you keep doing what you're doing because your music has helped me get out of some valleys some dark valleys amen I believe there's been some times where the Holy Ghost came by and pushed me and nudged me along a little bit and used your music to do it. And I didn't feel like going anymore and I, I was ready to give up. And the Holy Ghost would give me a little kick in my pants and push me down the road a little way. Amen. He used your music to do it. So you, keep, you keep doing what you're doing. Amen. Amen. You keep it up. What a blessing. You won't find Leonard Skinner in my CD player, but you'll find the Jonathan Brown family. Amen. Amen. Right now as we speak. Amen. <clears throat> it's especially an honor to be behind this pulpit right here. It's always an honor to preach for uh, the Johnsons and everything his dad did before. And Pastor Johnson picked up the torch, but the spirit, the, 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 he's, he's running with it. Amen. He's running with it, running with the torch. But uh, Brother Brian is such a dear friend of mine. Amen. He's a mentor and a great hero of the faith. Amen. He's one of my heroes of the faith. Amen. Probably my top three heroes of the faith right here. He's a living legend. Amen. Amen. And I would imagine it's been about 17 years ago when I met Brother Brian. It was at Dr. Petrick's church there in Illinois. And I knew right away he was my type of people. And I knew Amen. right away I wanted to be his friend. Amen. Amen. And he has been a true friend to me. Now, when I first met him, he was married to Miss Bonnie, and, uh, you know, she's passed away. And I was thinking this morning about when I first met Brother Brian and thinking about Miss Bonnie. I, believe, I hate to say it, but I believe that Miss Bonnie was a better cook than Miss Lydia. Because if you'd have seen Brother Brian back then, he was swole up like a dog tick. <laughs> now, we appreciate Miss Lydia taking care of him and, and uh, getting him in shape, amen. <laughs> And Miss Lydia, you please make sure he takes his fish oil and his vitamins and goes on his walks because we sure do need him. Amen. And thank you for taking care of him. Amen. And uh, she's got him shaped up. Amen. You wouldn't have recognized him back then. And my wife's like, oh, my goodness. She knows what I'm telling is true. Amen. <laughs> but we sure do need him. Amen. Amen. Boy, he took us to Calvary last night. Amen taught us the importance of going to Calvary every morning in our hearts and minds and, and taking a trip to Calvary. And I did this morning, preacher. The sun was coming up this morning, sitting on the back porch where we were staying. I, I tried to go to Calvary and think about what my Savior did for me. Amen. 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 And, uh, man, that was worth the drive coming just to hear that, Amen. just to hear him take us back to Calvary last night. You know, I never, I, I knew that the Bible taught it says there in uh, Psalms, it says there in Psalms 22, 14, Jesus, that's a prophetic song about Jesus where he said, and all my bones are out of joint. You know, I thought about Jesus' bones being out of joint before uh, from the, the crucifixion, but I never thought about his knees being out of joint before. And I believe based off this verse here, it says all my bones are out of joint. If there was a bone that could have come out of joint, it did come out of joint. And I got to thinking about that. How, how I got to think about uh, uh, someone's knee coming out of joint. And I Googled it, and it says, a kneecap can dislocate when it moves out of place from the groove in the knee joint, which can happen for a number of reasons, including sudden change in direction. When the knee is under stress and the leg suddenly changes direction, such as when playing sports or dancing, our Savior's knee was already under stress when they nailed him to that cross. And then when they dropped him into that socket in the ground, that hole in the ground, it dropped with such force 
The change of direction caused his knees to come out of joint. That's why I do what I do, folks. Amen. I'm not what I ought to be, but I'm trying to live for the Lord. I'm trying to serve the Lord. I'm trying to give my life to his service, and that's why I do what I do. Because of all he did for me. Amen. Amen. I got to thinking about how much I love North Carolina. I have a couple days I'll get to spend on my granddaddy's farm, and man, it is just teeming with wildlife. My brother sends me trail camera pictures of bear standing on top of the feeders and all underneath the feeders and laying on the feeders. Man, we got some of the largest black bear in the world. I mean, it's an absolute sportsman paradise right on the inner banks. Just, it, it, man, I, I, when I joined the military, I, I, before I joined the military, all I wanted to do was let, leave Colerain. I'm from Colerain, North Carolina, a little small town, northeast North Carolina. All I wanted to do was leave. I joined the military, and then I joined the military. All I wanted to do was go back. <laughs> all I wanted to do was go back. And for 20 years, I looked forward to going back home and, and living off the land and doing the things I enjoy. But the Lord had other plans for me. And the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because of those dislocated knees. Amen. Those dislocated shoulders. Yeah. Uh, Brother Dylan, he's a carpenter, and he frames with his dad. Sometimes his dad's shoulder pops out of joint uh, on the job, and his dad's in excruciating pain, and Dylan has to pop his shoulder back in joint. And, and I've been just thinking about what my Savior did for right. him. Right. That's what motivates me to try to live for him and try to serve him and love him. Amen? Amen. All right, you're in Acts chapter number 11. Verse number 26, stand with me if you would please, out of, in reverence and honor of God's word. We'll read one verse, I'll let you be seated. Stretch a little bit. Acts chapter 11, verse number 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for what you've already done under the tent this morning. Thank you for working in my heart just through the music, just through the singing. Lord, would you please continue to work? Lord, I ask you to forgive me my sins. I ask you to forgive me for doing anything that was displeasing to you and would hinder me from being used of you this morning. Father, I sure do need your touch. I pray you'd work through me this morning for your honor and for your glory. You'd give me the power and the filling of the Holy Spirit that I so desperately need. And I'll be careful to thank you for it. Lord, if there's one here that's lost and undone, never been saved, I pray they'll get it nailed down this morning. Yes. In Jesus' name, draw us closer to you today. Amen. Amen. May be seated. The title of my sermon is... I'm not sure if I'm a Christian or not. I'm not sure if I'm a Christian or not. Now, when I say I'm not sure I'm a Christian or not, I'm referring to the original use of the word Christian. Amen. The original use of the word Christian. So you have to understand the meaning of the word Christian changed. And I believe you can see it even changing the Bible. Uh, but Christian today, I don't believe means what it used to mean in the original sense. The word Christian basically changed into something uh, uh, that's being referred to someone who believes in the Bible, the Word of God, you know, believes that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and believe uh, that He was buried, rose again on the third day, and that you have to be saved. And the way you're saved is by faith alone and that Jesus is the only path to heaven. And I am that 150%. All right. I am that all the way. But if you want to know what the original meaning was, look at the last part of verse 26 again, if you would, please. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So the ones who were called Christians were disciples. That means they were followers. They were not just hearers of the word. They were doers of the word. Amen. That is why others called them that. Others recognize them as being followers of Jesus. Now, again, I do identify as the later definition of the word Christian. I do identify with that as, you know, what we would think of today in the modern sense of the word Christian. 
I do identify with that. But, but what I prefer to tell people, someone asked me what religion you are, what I prefer to tell them, I like to keep the original meaning, the original meaning of the word Christian. So this is what, and sometimes I forget, and you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, but here's what I like to tell people if they ask me what religion I am. I say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm a believer in the Bible, or I'm a Baptist. Amen. I definitely don't have no problem with that one. Amen. Jesus didn't have a problem with it either. He was baptized by a Baptist preacher. Amen. If you're baptized by a Lutheran, what does that make you? Lutheran. If you're baptized by a Catholic priest, what does that make you? Make you Catholic. Jesus is baptized by a Baptist preacher. Reckon he was Baptist. Amen. Amen. So I like to tell people I'm a believer, I'm a Baptist, because the original word, the original use of the Christian was not something they called themselves, but it was something other people called them. Other people called them that. Now one reason that I believe is that they recognize them as being like Christ. They called them Christians because they recognized they were being like Christ. Now, if you want to find out if I'm like Christ or not, you're going to have to ask my, my maybe you better ask my neighbors. Amen. Maybe you better ask my family. Maybe you better ask my wife. Maybe you better ask folks that I work on side jobs with. You know, ask them. If you want to know if I'm Christ, like ask them. Well, since the followers of Christ were first called Christians by others, they weren't called Christian because they had a T-shirt on that said Christian. Yeah. Right. They weren't called Christian because they had a bumper sticker with a fish on it or anything like that. Right. They were called Christian because obviously these others saw them doing something that caused them to think they were followers of Christ or, or they were right. acting like Christ. So if that's the case, I thought we would just look and see what they're doing. If they called them Christians because of something they were doing, then let's see what they were doing. Amen. And we can Amen. see what they were doing uh, to prompt being called Christians right here in this chapter. Look at verse 19, if you would, please. Acts chapter 11, verse number 19. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenice and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So this original group was after the Jews. But then look at verse number 20. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So they were going after everybody, man. They were going after the Jews, and then they were also going after the Greeks, man. They were going after everybody. Amen. Praise God. So number one, those who were first called Christians were trying to get others saved Amen. by preaching the word of God. Amen. One of the reasons why they called them Christians because they were doing what Jesus was doing. Amen. Jesus was going around preaching the gospel, trying to get other people saved. Amen. Right. I mean, that's the whole reason why he was even sent to seek and save that which was lost. Right. They were. They had the same mission, had the same mindset. Man, we need to go out. We need to seek and save that which is lost and Amen. preach the word of God and help others get saved. Amen. 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 Matthew four nineteen says, and he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus said, hey, if you follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Amen. That's what he told his disciples back then. I think it's still good for his disciples now. Amen. Luke 5, 10, And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. Jesus told Simon Peter, he said, you're going to catch men. Fishers of men are people who share their faith in Bible verses with others to try and catch others from Christ. Amen. That's what God wants us to do. Right. He wants to share, share our faith, share, share the gospel, share the good news with others. Let me give you a, a couple points about fishing. You know, if you want to be like these original Christians that were called Christians first, you need to start fishing. Amen. 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 Now, let me give you some uh, points about fishing. When it comes to fishing, it's very important to use the proper lure. You need to use the Bible. Amen. Amen. Use the Bible. That's why tracks have verses in them. That's why these little things we carry in our pockets and wallets have Bible verses in them. Because the Bible says we're born again of corrupt, incorruptible seed. Amen. It takes the Word of God to bring the new new birth, right. to bring new life. Uh, that's why you ought to learn some. You ought to be familiar with a handful of verses. Amen. You ought to get you one of these tracks like Brother Johnson has or 
uh, one some that we have a brother uh, Brown or brother Brian and, and, and learn a few verses learn a handful of verses man we Amen. learn everything else man you can learn NFL stats and uh, 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 you know you can learn NASCAR stats and batting stats man we can learn everything else why don't you learn some fishing verses Amen. Amen. learn a few verses man learn John three sixteen. Amen. Learn the Romans road. Amen. When it comes to fishing, if you're not doing it, you're not following Christ. Now listen to me carefully. I didn't say you had to fish to be saved. Right. I didn't say you had to fish to be saved. I didn't say you had to fish to go to heaven. But if you want to take up your cross and follow him, you ought to learn how to fish. Right. You have to start somewhere. Now when I first got saved, I knew about 30 years ago, I didn't know how to fish. But I knew how to give out a piece of paper with some tracks and verses on it. Amen. I knew how to give out some tracks, and I knew how to invite people to my church where some people who didn't know how to fish were. Amen. I did that for a long time, man. I just, hey, come on. Told my buddies, told my friends, hey, come to church with me. I didn't know how to catch them. I didn't know how to win them, but I knew somebody who did. Amen. Amen. And I invite them to church. I take them to church. Now, raise your hand if you're saved. Raise your hand if you're saved. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior. Let me ask you a question. What are you doing to fish for men? Mm. I want Praise you to Lord. know you're someone's minister. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. The Bible says every man has a minister. Right. Every man has a minister. You're somebody's minister. Okay. Hold it if you like. You're somebody's minister out there. You can reach someone that I will never be able to reach. You rub shoulders with people that I will never come in contact with. It's true. That's why God, you're saved. God made you someone's minister. Amen. Right? And you can reach them. You can help them. You can invite them to church. You can get them to gospel. You can give them a little tract or something with the, with the Bible, uh, uh, way to heaven on it until you learn how to reel someone in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Something else about fishing. Fishing so exciting. It is so exciting. You get to see the Lord move and work in people's lives. Amen. Not only the lives of the fish, but also the lives of the fishermen. Amen. Now, Amen. Let, me tell you, let me tell you a fishing story. I got so many fishing stories I can tell. <laughs> let me tell you a fishing story, something that happened here recently. It goes back to something that happened about a year ago. I guess about a year ago, I was on a, a rifle range sighting in a rifle. And I looked, and there was a Big old bearded, tatted up, burly man over there, and he had a really cool looking AK 47. It was all tricked out. I'd never, he had like checkerboard stuff on it, painted, and it was it was really cool looking. And I just struck up a call. I'm always looking for an opportunity to give somebody one of these little cards I got in my wallet. Says, Amen. Are you 100% sure you're going to heaven? And it's got a website, directions2heaven.com, and a QR code with a 10 minute video. I'm always looking for an opportunity to fish. And I just struck up a conversation with this guy about his AK-47, and he let me shoot it. And uh, we got to talking about guns and stuff, and I gave him a card, invitation to our church. And he, you know, he called me later that night, or texted me later that night, and said, I, I watched the video, he said, I received Christ. Amen. He said, I received Christ as my Savior. And I was, man, I was thrilled, man. I was shouting and just amazed that God would use somebody like me to get somebody a home in heaven, take a bloodbath, and get all their sins forgiven. Amen. And then not long after that, Brother Brian came and the Brown family with us. We had a tent set up. We had a turkey day. We were giving away free frozen turkeys. Every visitor got a free frozen turkey. Him and his wife came and got a free frozen turkey and helped me win. I won the contest. Amen. And, uh, you know, that was exciting, man. Just being a fisherman is exciting, man. That was exciting. Amen. Now I want to tell you about how God takes care of his fishermen. Just something that happened just last week. We've got a guy, Brother Dion's brother, Raymond. Some of you have been to our church. He's a little short fella. How tall is your brother? About four foot what? Four foot eleven. A little short fella. You know what I'm talking about, your Brother Brian? Married to a big old tall white white woman. And uh, he has been he, he's been coming to our church since we started in our house. And since he first started coming, he had an old Suburban. He loves, he's a diehard Suburban guy. He had an old 90s model Suburban, and I'd give him a hard time. He'd park in our front yard and rud our yard all up in his <laughs> Suburban. I'd give him a hard time about it. But, buddy, he has been faithful. Amen. I'm talking Amen. faithful. He's gone to 
church conferences and soul winning events, and he's got 350 some thousand miles in that suburban man, and he's about he's burned that thing up for the Lord. Amen. The what the guy with the window won't even roll up. Hey, man, he just they, they they just let the rain run right in it, and they don't even care, man. <laughs> he got four kids, and boy, he has been faithful. One of our most faithful families for the last over eight years. And uh, I noticed his suburban was broke down in the church parking lot. And uh, I didn't say nothing about the first week. Then after about three weeks, I said, you know what? I might better get him to move that. I hope that thing ain't leaking oil all over the <laughs> driveway. He cut that dip, but he just, at the same time, he called me. He said, Pastor, I'm sorry, Mom. My suburban's broke down in the church parking lot. I'm going to try to put a new transmission in it. He said, this is what's going on with it. He said, what do you think I, what do you recommend I do? I said, brother, I hate to see you drop any more money in that thing. He said, it's going to cost about $1,000 to get a new transmission. I said, I hate to see you put any more money in that. And uh, he, he said, I said, just pray about what to do. Just pray about it. And uh, he started praying, and his wife had gotten a little bit concerned about it. They had been borrowing their stepdad's truck. And uh, Tahoe, and uh, his wife's getting a little bit worried. He said, "Honey, don't you worry about it." He said, "The Lord will take care of us." Yeah. Amen. Do you know the next day, that big old boy that I gave that track to, his name Stonk. You're not gonna believe this preacher. He sent me a text. He said he knew we liked to help people because he saw us giving away turkeys. He said, "I know you're a man in the know," and he said, "I know you know people in need." He said, I've got a late models, a late 90s model Suburban. He said, I've put a lot of money in it. He said, I put a new motor, motor in it. It's got 11,000 miles on it. He said, it's got headers on it. He said, it's got an aftermarket exhaust. He said, you ought to hear it run. Amen. He said, I had put a lot of money into it. He was his baby, but he had to get rid of it. And he said, I, I had started, I, I originally asked $7,000 for it, but it wasn't moving, so I lowered it down to three, and it still ain't moving. And now I'm just wanting to give it away. He said, you know anybody? He said, do you know anybody that can use it? Do you know anybody that can need it? You tell me God don't take care of his fishermen. Amen. I wouldn't trade being a fisherman for anything in all the world. A fisherman for God for anything in all the world. No amount of bucks, no amount of bears. No amount of anything would I trade for being a fisherman for God. I get to see God move and save people and change lives and clean up lives. And I get to see God's hand moving and working, man. I love being a fisherman for God. Hey, Praise man. God. Amen. Hey, man. I yes, love sir. It. Yes, sir. You know what I got to think about, Brother Brian? That's the second time God's given somebody a fisherman in our church a vehicle. We got another boy who's got all them kids. CJ gave him a, he, somebody, wasn't even a believer. You know, God can use unbelievers for his glory. That's right. An unbeliever gave him a, a Tahoe so he could fit all his family. And he didn't have enough room. And he had so many kids, he couldn't fit all his kids in his car. And uh, God gave him a, a Tahoe. But I was telling my wife, you know something I've noticed? Every time I've seen God give somebody a car, he was a Chevrolet, brother. <laughs> a Chevrolet. GM, I guess, stands for God's Motors. I told you last year the devil gave y'all that Ford truck. <laughs> they came to Texas, had a Ford truck. Brother Brown couldn't even turn the thing off. He was scared it wouldn't start. Drove all the way from Texas to North Carolina without turning the truck off. At least now he's got a ram, amen. I guess the Lord's okay with that because, uh, you know, he the, the, the ram caught in the thicket. You know, I pictured the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. <laughs> I said, uh, number one, those who were called Christians first preached the word. Amen. Number two, they prioritized church in their lives. Look down at verse number 26, if you would, please. Good. It's good. Verse number uh, 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. We see them assembling themselves at a church and then the very next sentence they were called Christians. They're assembling at church very next sentence called Christians. Maybe that's because Christians what Christians are supposed to do. Amen. They're supposed to go to church. Amen. Amen. Not just like fish, and you don't have to go to church to be saved. You don't have to go to church to go to heaven. It's, that's just by faith. That's a free gift. 
But if you want to be like Christ, you do. Yeah. Right. If you want to be like Christ, you, you need to get in church. Amen. You need to prioritize church in your life. Here's what it said about Jesus in Luke 4, 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Jesus had a custom of going to the house of God. Jesus had a custom of going to church. I believe we should also. We should have a custom of going to church. I thought the other day, uh, Brother Brian, as I was going to church, I said, you know what? If my neighbors wanted to rob me blind, they know exactly when to do it. <laughs> they know exactly when to do it because my neighbor, your neighbors ought to know when you're not going to be home because right. you're going to be at church. Right. You ought to have a custom. You ought to have a schedule. Your neighbors ought to know where you're going to be come church time. Amen? Right. Amen. Jesus prioritized church and his early followers did also. I'm honored today to have my grandmama with us. My grandmama's from, uh, she lives down past uh, Newburn in Oriental, North Carolina. And my grandmama's fixing to turn 101 this month. Amen. I want to give her a hand. Y'all give her yeah. a hand. Amen. I'm going to brag on my grandmama a little bit. My grandmama taught me as a young boy to prioritize your life around church. My granddaddy bought my grandmama a new minivan. And she had an older Astro van, and she wouldn't let my granddaddy get rid of it. She dedicated that van. She turned that whole van into her church van. She kept the yard, the First Baptist Church of Oriental, North Carolina. She manicured the lawn and weeded the flower beds and took care of the flower beds. And that whole van was dedicated. That was her church van. She had all her gardening tools, her pot and soil. That van was dedicated for her church van. Amen? My Amen. grandmama had centered church was a central theme of her life. My grandparents had prioritized church in their life, lives, and they taught me to do that. Amen? Amen. They taught me to do that. Amen. Praise God, my mama took me to church. Amen. Amen. My mama's here this morning as well. Praise God. My mama took me to my grandmama's church. Amen? Let me tell you how much Jesus loved church. Acts 20, 28. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's right. Yeah. That tells you something. Jesus yeah. loved the church so much, he bought it with his blood. Yeah. Amen. I think he loves church. Amen. Yeah. If he's willing to buy it with his blood, I think he loved it. I think we ought to love it. Amen. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me just help you this morning. If he built it and bought it, he expects us to be in it. That's right. Amen. Amen. He expects us to be in it. He built it. He bought it. He didn't do that for nothing. He did that so we would be in it. Amen? Amen. And we should be glad about it. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's right. You ask my wife for 28 years now since I've been living for the Lord. So long, ain't one time she's had to drag, twist my arm and, 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 and drag me to church. I look forward to church, man. Amen. I love church. Amen. I love being with God's people. Amen. I said, number one, they preached the word. Number two, they prioritized church in their lives. And number three, they poured out their love one for another. Look at verse number 24. Good. Verse number 24. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. Now, when it says much people was added unto the Lord, I believe this means they got saved. But if you look in Acts chapter 2, that word added is used for them joining the church. I believe not only they got saved, but they joined the church. Verse 26, we see them assembling together. And something caused this. Something caused them to get saved. And then something caused them to join the church. And I think I know what made the difference. I think I know what made the difference. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. By this shall all men know that you, have, that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And if some have compassion, making a difference. Amen. You know, love and compassion is what will make the difference in this community. Amen. I believe love and compassion for one another made a difference then, and it will make a difference now. About two weeks ago, I was in the shower. I was dead dog tired, ready to go to bed. And I got a call around 10 o'clock. Pastor R.A. Smith in the Fort Worth Baptist Temple 
called me. He's one of my favorite preachers in all the world to listen to. He's a friend of mine. And he explained to me a situation. He told me, well, I, I couldn't take answer the phone because I had soap all in my eyes and everything. My wife answered the phone. He said, tell your husband to call me when he gets out of the shower. Draw off and call me. He said, this is an emergency. I said, boy, it must be an emergency. He kept calling me at 10 o'clock at night. So I dried off as quick as I could, and I called uh, Brother Smith there. And he told me a situation. He said there was a family that had joined, was, was in our church, members of his church. The whole family saved, loves the Lord. And they had moved down to uh, Kingsville, Texas, about two hours south of San Antonio, and the husband had thought he had a chest cold. He went to the doctor and uh, ended up having, uh, what was it, tuberculosis? Crystal, is that what it was? Tuberculosis? Leukemia. It was leukemia. Yeah, it was leukemia. He ended up having leukemia. And he started coughing up blood and went to seizures. And they had him on a ventilator, and it looked like he didn't look good. It looked like he wasn't going to make pull through. Dr. Smith told me, he said, I can't make it tonight. I can't make it down there. He said, I wondered if you'd go represent me. If you go pray with the family and just represent me, if you would, please. And uh, I said, well, do you think they'll let me in? You know, it's late. It's after business hours. I said, do you think they'll let me in? He said, if you go, if you go down there like the man of God, they will. I said, yes, sir. I said, I'm going to get my suit and tie. I'm going to get my coat and tie on right now. I'm a as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, I wanted to Man. go down there professional, put my suit, and my coat and tie on. And I went down there. I got down there about 11 o'clock. I told uh, Miss Sanchez, I told her that Pastor Smith was a good friend of mine. And I said, we're here to help you and assist you any way we can. The next day, she, I stayed with him, prayed with him for a little while. And next day, she told me that it doesn't look good. And they were put... They were probably going to be pulling the plug, and the girls were on the way. Had four, four uh, teen girls. I think I don't know. So I think it was from 10 to 18, I believe it was. And the grandmama were on the way from Kingsville, and uh, they needed a place to stay. I said, "Yes, ma'am, we got it. We got you." And I already told her the night before that we'd put them up, do anything we could to help them. So I contacted a young lady from our church and got her to go stock up their suite. Uh, I got, got told her I needed need her to go get some groceries and. My wife is going to be getting them a suite, getting them a room, and I needed them to put some groceries in there and get it comfortable for them. And my wife called the Country Inns and Suites and explained the situation to the Filipino woman that was helping her make the reservation. And my wife was telling her about the whole situation and how people were going to be staying. She wanted to make sure we had enough room because there were about seven people. Some of them were going, they were going to take shift work. Some of them were going to stay with uh, Brother Sanchez, and the other ones were going to be sleeping, and they were going to take shift work. And uh, my wife was telling them we need something big enough to fit all of them. And uh, my wife said, and the church is going to cover it. And they got all the accommodations taken care of. And then my wife told her, she said, I heard my wife tell her, she said, but before I let you go, I want to tell you about our website. She said, we got a little website. It's called directions2heaven.com, our church made. And I want you to watch it because it's got a little 10-minute video to tell you how you can be 100% sure how to go to heaven one day. And you know what she said? She said, ma'am, your kindness has hooked me. I will be glad to watch that video. Amen? Amen. What made the difference? Love and compassion. Right. Amen? Yeah. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love. One to another. I can't think, man, I, you talking about a, a demonstration of love. All the work Pastor Johnson and Miss Johnson and his family and his people have gone through to feed people every night and put this up. He's going to be ready for a vacation after this is over. I guarantee you. I, I've done it before. Fixing to do it in a couple of months. <laughs> it's a lot of work. A lot of money. It's a huge demonstration of love. And I hope that if you don't have a good church in this area to go to, you will consider this it's your church home. Amen? Amen. Amen. Maybe you're like me this morning. And maybe you don't really know if you're a Christian or not. According to the original sense of the word. Now, chances are if you're here this morning on a Sunday morning, you're a Christian according to how we use it in modern terms, modern times. But maybe you're here this morning like me and you don't know how you know Christ-like you are. But maybe you're like me and you want to be. Amen. You want to be more like our Savior. You're trying to be like us, like our Savior. Now listen to me. I'm not sure how Christ-like I am, 
But one thing I am sure about, <laughs> there's one thing I am sure about, I've been washed in his blood. Yes. And I'm his child. That's yes. right. The Bible says his spirit bears witness with yes. my spirit that I'm a child of God. I Amen. know that I know that I know I've been born again. That's right. I know that I know that I know there was a place in time in my life where I realized I was a sinner and I realized I couldn't save myself and I put all my faith and trust Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ and received him yes. as my Savior. I know that this morning. I'm sure of that. Amen. Amen. I'm going to close with this story. Uh, I guess it's been two, three years ago, my wife and I celebrated our 25th anniversary. And we went to South Dakota to a pastor friend of mine. And he's got a little cabin on his church property. And boy, we had the biggest time. And I read the book and saw that you had been there, Brother Brian. I read the book and saw y'all had, did y'all honeymoon there? Yeah. Amen. Did you go, Miss Lydia? You didn't? Yeah, amen. And uh, awesome, neat place, wasn't it? And I saw that preacher had been there. But we went and took a tour to the crazy horse where they, the Indian's face is carved in the, in, in the rocks there. And uh, we went and took a tour of that place and there was they had some shows they were doing. And there was a Native American man who was, played a flute and told some stories and things. And it's very interesting. We went and we sat and listened to him play his hand-carved flute. And he told a story. He, he, he sung a song uh, he named after his wolf. I think that's what I think the song he had dedicated this song to his timber wolf and he told us this story and I want to share this story with you before we close he said when he was a young boy living on a reservation his family were sheep herders and some of the one of the, one of the sheep had escaped and gotten away and his family had rescued a little timber wolf and it was his pet they raised it from his little puppy and it was his pet and he said he took the timber wolf with him and his best friend to go look for that sheep. And they gotten so far away from the house, uh, Brother Brown, he said by the time he realized it, he said, I'll never be able to get back in time before it gets dark. And he didn't have flashlight or anything with him. So he said, I don't want to uh, be stuck in the dark. We're going to go ahead and hunker down right here and just spend the night. They built a little fire. And said he was fixing to go to bed. And all of a sudden he noticed his timber wolf started growling. And he looked, and he could see some eyes glowing. From the, fire, the, 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 the fire had illuminated a mountain lion's eyes. And that mountain lion, he could tell it was getting closer and closer. And he was scared. He was worried, and his dog, his timber wolf, was growling. And he said the next thing he knew, Brother Brown, he felt some liquid on him. And he looked, and that timber wolf had hiked his leg up and was urinating on him. And he said, what in the world? Not only am I getting ready to be, not only am I fixing to be eaten by a mountain lion, but my best friend's peeing on me. <laughs> he started having a pity party, man. And then all of a sudden it dawned on him. He realized what was going on. He said, son... Woo! I'm fixing to have a spell, Brother Brian. He said that timber wolf was marking him as his own. He said that timber wolf was saying, if you want to get me, uh, get my, 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 my son here, my friend here, you got to go through me. This is my property. And when he said that, I got to thinking about how I'm marked. And I got to thinking, my eyes swelled up with tears about how Jesus Christ marked me as his own and hey. saved me. It protected me and That's saved right. me, praise God. Amen. Amen. That's right. And my tears started swelling up. My, my eyes started swelling up with tears. And I went up to that Native American man afterwards. And I said, that was an awesome story. And I said, it brought tears to my eyes. I said, because I wasn't saved by the liquid from a timber wolf. But I was saved by the blood of a spotless lamb. Hey, and I said, the best part about it is I didn't deserve it. If I got what I deserved, I'd bust hell wide open. But I put my faith and my trust in the sinless, spotless lamb of God. And he saved my wretched soul. I said, he'll save you too, sir, if you'll trust him. If you'll call on him. And I gave him a card. But I'm Amen. so thankful I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I'm so thankful I've been marked as one of Christ's own. Amen. Amen. It's good.
It said in verse 22, it said, and they believed and turned to the Lord. Do you know the crystal clear message of the Bible is that all you have to do is believe in Jesus? Amen. All you have to do is believe in I'm so thankful God made it child friendly. Amen. So many religions out there want to confuse you and say yeah. you got to jump through this hoop and jump yeah. through that hoop and be baptized, patronized, homogenized, Hail Mary full of grace running around the pillowcase. And ain't none of that stuff going to save you. Amen. There's one thing, and one thing I want to save you, that's believing in Jesus. Amen. Now, when I say believe in Jesus, I'm not talking about believing in Him like Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. That's not going to get anybody into heaven. When I say believe in Jesus, I'm talking about putting your faith and trust in Him. If I said, uh, uh, I believe in you, if I told Brother Andrew, Brother Andrew, I believe in you, what am I saying? I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you. And that's exactly what you have to do to Jesus Christ. you got to put your faith and trust in Him. I want to help you do that this morning. If you're underneath this tent, under the sound of my voice, and have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's a few things you have to understand in order to put your faith and trust in Jesus. I want to help you with that this morning. first thing you have to understand is you're a sinner. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us sinners. All means all, and that's all means. It means every single one of us have sinned. Sin is when we break God's commandments where every single one of us is guilty of that. Amen? Amen. Right. The second thing you have to understand is the penalty or the punishment for breaking God's laws, God's commandments. See, the good news is if we'll believe in Jesus and receive him in our heart, his blood washes our sins away, our past sins, present sins, our future sins are all under the blood of Jesus. That's the good news. Uh, but the bad news is if you don't get forgiven, if you don't get your sins washed away, there's only one place for you to go. It ain't purgatory. Right. Purgatory doesn't exist. It's a place called hell. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire, which burneth right. with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Oh, but thanks, thanks be to God that He doesn't want us to go to uh, He doesn't want us to go to hell. Amen. The Bible says, "But the gift of God is eternal life." Amen. But the gift of God is eternal life. Man, I love that butt part. One preacher said, God's butt saved my butt. Amen. <laughs> God butted in and said, but the gift of God's Amen. eternal life. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, Amen. but the gift of God's eternal life. Praise God. He butted in. Praise God for the That's gift. Right. I want to emphasize two things here in that verse, gift and eternal. The Bible says the gift of God's eternal life. The reason why it's a gift is because he paid for it. Amen. He paid Amen. For it. No works required. Because if you thought you had to pay for it on your own or you thought you had to work your way to heaven, you're not trusting Jesus, you're trusting yourself. Right. That's right. You've got to put 100% faith in Jesus, 100% trust in Jesus. See, it's not about what we do, it's about what he did. Amen. We don't get into heaven by what we do, we get into heaven by what he did. Right. Works gets us rewards, but it does not reserve us a place in heaven. Amen. It, reserve, it gets us rewards, but it does not get us a place in heaven. That's good. And then the other word I want to talk about in that verse is eternal. Eternal. The Bible says the gift of God is eternal life. That means it lasts forever. Amen. See, if you got the gift today and then one year later you slipped up and had a bad day and you committed sins, some sins and he took it from you, it wasn't eternal. Right. It was temporary. Right. But not only that, he's a thief. Yeah. Right. If he took something he gave to you, man, if you give something to somebody as a gift and you come back a year later and take it, man, you're a thief. Right. That's their property. God's not a thief. He's not a liar. He said this gift lasts forever. The gift of God's eternal life. The Bible says that God, the Bible teaches God's married to the backslider. Amen. You can backslide and he'll whoop you. He'll give you a whooping. But you're still married to him. Amen. Still Amen. married to him. Our faith may fail, but his grip will not slip. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Two more verses and we're done. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, when a person confesses something, they're acknowledging it. You have to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. That means he's the boss, he's the master of the universe, not Buddha, not Allah. Jesus is the only path to heaven. He's the only one getting us through in pearly gates. Not yourself, not anybody else. Jesus. Amen. It's all about Jesus. And then it says, believe in that heart that God hath raised him to the dead. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He shed his blood to wash our sins away if we would believe in him and trust in him. He gave up the ghost. He died. He took him down and put him in a borrowed tomb because he wasn't going to be keeping it long. Amen. He stayed in the borrowed tomb for three days, three nights. Then he come up out of there proving he is the boss. That's how we know Christianity is a true religion. Muhammad's still in his grave. Buddha's still in his grave. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. You have to believe that. You have to believe that Jesus did that. 
And then the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you'll call on Him, if you'll believe these things that we talked about, and you'll call on Him, and you'll receive Him in your heart, the Bible says you shall be saved. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to ask you a question. If you are 100% sure that you have been saved, 100% sure that you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that if you died today, you'd go to heaven by the grace of God, I want you to raise your hand if you would, please. Raise your hand if you're 100% sure you've been saved. Amen. Hands all over the building. Praise God. Probably the majority of people here this morning are saved. Thank you. May lower your hands. But if you couldn't raise your hand this morning, if you're not 100% sure that heaven would be your home, if you passed away today, I want to give you an opportunity right now to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you realize that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself and you want, it, you want Jesus to save you, I want to lead you in a prayer right now, right in your seats. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to call anybody out. I'm not going to single anybody out. I want to pray with you right in your seats. And this is not a magic formula. All this prayer does is just prompt you and help you receive Jesus in your heart. Put all your faith and trust in Him. If you believe the things we've talked about and you're ready to be saved, I want you to repeat this prayer. You can repeat it in your heart or you can do it out loud. Whatever you want to do, God will hear it if you mean it from your heart. I want you to pray with me. Pray this prayer if you want to be saved. Say, Dear Jesus, the best way that I know how, I open up my heart and receive you as my Savior. I'm trusting only in you, Jesus, and not my works or my religion. Please forgive me my sins and please save me. Thank you for giving me eternal life. Please help me to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to give you an opportunity to thank God for saving you. I wouldn't embarrass anybody, call anybody out, single anybody out for any all the money in the entire world. But I tell you what, if you prayed that prayer, I want to give you an opportunity to just slip your hand up and say, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I prayed that prayer, and I want to thank you. And then I want to ask you to hold it up because I want to rejoice that you prayed, and I want to give a report to Pastor Johnson and say, it was worth it. All the work, all the 